Thank you very much. And um, sorry, my apologies that I don't speak Swedish. Um, at least written on the web, um, I have the advantage of Google Translate, so I can follow what happens on Twitter better than I can follow what people are actually saying. Um, so, um, also, if you wish to ask me a question, then obviously I'd appreciate it if that work could be uh, in English rather than in Swedish. So, uh, my apologies, uh, my apologies for that. Um, the title that was given to me uh, to speak about today here is uh, "Social Media and Its Role in Influencing People." Um, there's a lot that you can say behind that title, um, and I'm going to try to kind of unpack that into three main lessons which there are for you, to, uh, for you to draw. It's worth saying that at least on the basis of the initial engagement in this room, I'm very impressed by the level of social media activity. If we put together uh, similar people in a British or a German environment, I think there would probably be less activity in social media in the room. So my apologies if I'm telling you things that you already know. Anyway. First lesson for social media, and this is for Svanen, and it's for all of you in your own companies and organizations, is the time is now. Um, that is in the main because for every passing day, it gets harder and harder to manage to make headway in social media. Yeah? Um, it is because we are now uh, used to the way that social media works. We've all, tr well, almost all of us, have tried it. In Sweden, in, in Northern Europe, the UK, some other European countries less, we are reaching the stage where the user numbers in social media, particularly for Facebook, more about that later, are not actually going up very much. Yeah. And also, the big campaigns which were run at the beginning, which gained media traction, yeah, it's harder to run those any, any longer. Now, there was one, you may be aware of it, in Sweden, Bevara Osvan Götuvold, I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, yeah, my apologies, um, which was a campaign running 2007 in Sweden, um, which managed within one week to get 100,000 members of a Facebook group in Sweden, yeah, at a time when Facebook had 200,000 members. Yeah. You can forget it if you think you're going to get half of the Swedish Facebook uh, users um, uh, to be backing whatever it is that you do these days. Sweden now has 4.5 million users of Facebook, and the most liked company, um, which is a maker of, um, of licorice sweets yeah, in the Swedish environment, has uh, 350,000 likes, so representing only something less than 10% of the total users. So that kind of experience seems to show that um, this sort of thing that they managed to do, getting 100,000 people in a week, because the mainstream press in Sweden was interested in that, kind of, in that kind of campaign in social media. For every passing day, it's harder to gain that kind of traction. That, and also, bear in mind that the more time goes by, so these cycles speed up. Yeah? I'm only here yeah, because I was an early adopter of this technology. I'd worked out how blogging works, I'd worked out how Facebook works, how Twitter works, and everything before everyone else had realized that it was going to be something that was important. The difficulty is for every new technology, the time from it being something that only tech nerds like me are using to it becoming mainstream, that cycle is increasing faster and faster and faster. So from my own personal experience as well, the biggest campaign which I've ever run was this in the UK. It was known as the Atheist Bus Campaign. Um, we ran in uh, 2009 an online fundraising campaign. We had no organization backing that campaign at that time. It was me, a blogger, and a journalist who managed to raise £150,000, so that's about uh, 1.2 million Swedish crowns, to pay for this advertising campaign, so quite controversial on the side of, uh, on the side of London buses. So we managed to put together an organization on the web which then gained traction in the mainstream media. We had stories written about us in the mainstream newspapers, in the Times, Telegraph, and so on, which drove people back to the website, which actually then pr pr prompted these people to then donate. Because atheists had never done advertising before, this set off a cycle, mainstream media to social media, and those integrating effectively. If we were trying to do this now, we might succeed, but we wouldn't have succeeded to the same extent, and it became a big, um, a big thing, and it's known now that atheists in the UK uh, are the people that advertise uh, advertise on public transport. So those sorts of experiences, Sweden and the UK would say it gets harder for every passing day to get something that's genuinely big and interesting running in social media. That is because of something known as the long, partly uh, the long tail of the internet, which is one of the things which is in the booklets that you have uh, in front of you. That says that on the far side, 
things which get an enormous number of views, likes, or followers, there are very few of them. Yeah? Particularly things like YouTube videos. So um, uh, the number of YouTube videos which get millions of views is very, very few. Yeah? The number of YouTube vi videos which get um, very few views is millions. Yeah? The most commonly numbered number of viewer views of a YouTube video is one. Yeah? The person that uploaded it. Yeah? So those are all of those people down at the bottom there. And the same can be said for whatever it is, likes on Facebook, followers on Twitter, numbers of blog readers, whatever it may be. And as the years go by, that graph gets steeper and steeper for any given, for any given technology. You'll see this sort of thing particularly as well, most notably in blogging in Sweden, where you're seeing a growing together of, of traditional journalists and bloggers. Those people who kind of could blog in their uh, at home in addition to what they did as a day job, the number of those kind of classic sort of amateur bloggers, if you like, those are getting less and less in the main because we're coming to some kind of situation where a very f a small number of blogs in any given market are at at right at this end, and then anyone who's kind of an amateur is down here somewhere and gets relatively little traction um, for their for their content. So. Before that curve gets too steep, get active now, learn the rules, work out how it goes. Yeah? Um, I'm sat over here on the Google Plus table. Yeah? There's been a big innovation in Google Plus this week, which is uh, allowing companies to open Google Plus pages for the first time. This was not allowed until this week. How many of you here for your companies or organizations have made a Google Plus page yet? A couple, good. Um, so that is just this week, do it before someone else has got that name. Even if it's quiet initially, at least know the ropes. We don't know whether Google Plus is going to really succeed yet, but nevertheless, use that opportunity to be ahead of the curve so you're one of the first ones there, at least learning, before you then work out whether it's actually the right tool for your organization. Right. So that's the first lesson. Time is now. The second is you need to use the right tools to influence the right people. That may seem obvious, um, but what do I mean by that? Um, first of all, it's worth saying you will find networks of people who care about basically anything on the web. You've just got to find the right ways and means and tools to manage to reach those individuals. So I was working a couple of weeks ago um, with some people who deal with safety of truck drivers. Yeah. And they said to me, well, we know you're here at this seminar, John, talking about safety of truck drivers, but we don't know how to appeal to these people on the web. So I said, well, have you looked at truck driver forums talking about the performance of the latest Volvo engine or uh, the best place to get a, um, a good snack while on a particular motorway? But do people really discuss that online? They said to me, well, of course they do, because anything where people are caring about something, you will find those individuals who are active and engaged. For reasons I don't understand, there are some bloggers in the UK who write about these things, garden sheds. Yeah? Whatever it is, you will find people, wherever they are, talking about those things that matter to them. Yeah? It just so happened I happened to have a picture, not of this shed, on my own blog and got linked by the Sheds blog. Um, so that kind of demonstrates the kind of depth of the obsession, if you like. Wherever you find people who care about something, you will find those people building networks on the web. Some statistics um, about the use, then, of, of uh, social networks and where you kind of find your people. Okay? So... You have to take some of this with a bit of a pinch of salt, and I'm, I'm, I've not got perfectly matching statistics for Sweden for the different uh, for um, the different social networks. Um, but this is as far as I am um, uh, as far as I can get it. This comes from a brilliant website called CheckFacebook.com, which is a website dedicated only to Facebook demography. Um, the gender breakdown of uh, Facebook users in uh, Sweden is a slight majority of women to 53% to 47% of men. That is typical of all mature markets for Facebook. Men tend to be early adopters when a, a, a Facebook market is peaked yeah, or has got, got to a kind of a, pla a plateau. Uh, you end up with a majority of women on, that, on, on, on Facebook across all developed countries. There are 4.5 million Facebook accounts uh, in uh, Sweden, representing 49.6% of the population. It is worth saying in that regard that in Sweden, if someone is a member of a social network, yeah, they are a member on average of 1.5 social networks. That means yeah, oh, that rather few people are a member of any social network other than Facebook. Yeah? 
in Northern Europe, yeah, there is the least average number of social networks that any individual will join. Basically meaning that when people talk in the Nordic countries of social networks, they mean essentially, for most of the population, first and foremost, Facebook. Okay. The breakdown in the age on Facebook is also very interesting. This is a very old Facebook demographic in, in, um, in Sweden. If you're in a market which is just developing, you have three quarters of the pie, which is 18 to 24 year olds and 25 to 34 year olds. In Sweden, that's now less than 50% of the pie. And it's Facebook, if it's growing strongly in any, in any sectors, it's the 45 to 54 and 55 to 64 year olds where it's growing um, still rather strongly. Put that in the global context, Facebook has pushing 800 million accounts. Even those people, again, I haven't got, there's no way of knowing this in Sweden. In the USA, even those people that are not on Facebook, about 50% of the US population um, uh, is, but 88% of the people are aware of its existence. So even people, there are more people who are aware of Facebook than actually use the internet in the USA. And I think you can probably count on the same sorts of numbers um, uh, in any uh, developed internet market as well. And the average Facebook user has 130 friends. So that's the kind of, uh, that's the sort of average size of, of uh, an individual. And these are stats all up to date as of this week um, from uh, checkfacebook.com. The interesting one for you representing companies and organizations, however, yeah, is like, i.e. what are the chances that someone likes your organization on Facebook? Anyone want to have a guess at the number, average number of likes that any individual person has on Facebook? Or uh, an individual person likes how many pages on average? Anyone want to shout out a number? 300. Wow, this is someone an active Facebook user here. Four, that's closer. The average across Facebook as a whole is 9.8. Okay. So you, if you wish to get your company or your organization to be one of those things that people like, you know, you've got to be one of less than 10. Okay? That is, uh, th again, that is th those are statistics primarily from the United States, but I think there's something to it. Even if that number were 15 within Sweden, your, your, uh, your, your problem is essentially still the same one. Yeah. And there is a, um, for e again, for every passing day, it gets harder and harder to persuade people they ought to like you rather than doing all the other things that they're doing on Facebook already. Okay. But nevertheless, the advantage with Facebook is you have a massive wide reach which trumps any other social network in Sweden. Okay. Next up, Twitter. Um, there are uh, and these are statistics from February of this year, so this is a little out of date, but there are no more up-to-date statistics I'm aware of, or at least I could find. Um, there are 90,000 accounts um, who have been tweeting in Swedish, but because I, even I've added odds and ends of things in Swedish over the years, may, uh, maybe I count among that number. Um, there are 35,000 accounts in Sweden that are in active use. Compare that to the Facebook numbers, and that's a very, very small number. And across Twitter overall, yeah, 5% of users write 75% of the tweets. Yeah? So that's, again, kind of long tail of the net, if you like. Yeah? You've got a small number of people who are producing a lot of the content. The statistics overall for Twitter, 81% of people follow less than 100 people. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself on the slides. I apologies. And the last one, 87% are aware of the existence of Twitter, only in the USA, only 1% less than the people who are aware of the existence of Facebook. So while it might have a very small user base yeah, and an even small basis of people who are actually actively using Twitter. Nevertheless, the numbers of people that are actually um, uh, know of its existence yeah, are actually, um, actually almost at the, at the Facebook levels. There's been some research, oh, that doesn't really come out very nicely there. This is a map of tweets by language in Europe. Um, you can just about make out the different countries here. Massive levels of activity in the Netherlands. The UK's in grey there. It's not that, it's just that the contrast is not showing it particularly well. It's not that the UK is a kind of complete Twitter free zone. Um, um, Sweden, Sweden, at least in this, in language terms, yeah, you can see here that, like, for Poland, for example, is basically, that is correct, I can com confirm that off my screen, is basically completely blank. The main metropolitan areas are generating, in a European comparison, a reasonably high level of, of, uh, of activity on Twitter. The advantage for you guys, obviously, is not in the numbers of people that Twitter can potentially reach, it's the types of people that Twitter can reach. You can reach plenty of journalists in, um, uh, in Sweden. There are many Aftonbladet journalists, for example, who, um, who are very active in, uh, in, in social media. They're, um, they're, 
Uh, Chief political editor Carlin Pedersen, for example, is very active on, on Twitter. You can find ways and means of reaching those individual journalists using that, me using that, that means. Our speaker later on, Birgitta Olsen, the Europe Minister, again, a, a politician very active and actually, I and actually interactive on Twitter with 9,200 followers. And probably best of all, but writing mostly in, uh, in English, Carl Bildt, who is at a level of uh, something in the region of 45,000 followers uh, on Twitter. But I'm not sure the total statistics of the number of those that are actually, that are actually in Sweden. So what you've managed to do, and I think today's seminar is a testimony to this, is Twitter is a way of managing to reach other opinion formers quite effectively and in a swift and reciprocal manner. Facebook doesn't necessarily offer the tools in order to manage to do that. I don't know how many of us around in this room today will be able to find a way of using Facebook to help us with the professional networking from this event. Just a quick couple of slides on some of the other social networks. Uh, LinkedIn, there are 675,000 accounts on LinkedIn in Sweden, which puts it uh, um, considerably higher than Twitter in terms of total user accounts. It's fine to add your boss as a contact on LinkedIn in a way you might not want to add your boss as a friend on Facebook. Um, but the difficulty is, is the level of activity is much, much lower. There are people that are logging in once a week, once a month, something like that. So the number of interesting um, uh, campaigning activities or ways of achieving influence, which I'm aware of on, in LinkedIn in a European market, is nil. Know, it is sometimes useful for professional networking, but not much more than that. So it has considerable reach, but that professionalism of it is both its strength and its weakness. And then last but not least, um, blogging. There's still something like 200 million blogs worldwide. The difficulty is with blogging is it feels hard these days in comparison to um, uh, the kind of interactivity and quick reactions in, uh, in social networking. As I kind of mentioned in passing, we are seeing the creation of essentially hybrid media organizations. When bloggers are employed as mainstream media journalists, mainstream media journalists are writing blogs. Um, bloggers are called on to co be co become commentators in the mainstream media. So you're seeing blogging growing together with the kind of online aspects of the, of the traditional media. So that's a kind of quick overview of some of the different ways and means and the questions and the things you have to ask yourselves about uh, the, different, uh, the different tools to use. Then the third issue is um, a more theoretical, well not kind of theoretical one, but a kind of um, ethical issue, if you like, for, for social media. This is called credible commitment. This is the things you need to bear in mind before you start, being engage start engaging in social media, because social media being a two-way communications uh, tool, what are you going to do when you ask people something in social media? What do you do with what they tell you? Yeah, and that's what this story is about. So I've got a little, just a story of one particular case, which involves this man, Silvio Berlusconi, um, who, um, I'll just tell the story and then I'll draw out what the, 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 what credible commitment means. Mr. Berlusconi was turning up in a European Union summit in Brussels in December of last year, um, and he was arriving there the day after he had succeed, he, he, he'd survived a no-confidence vote in the Italian parliament. It's probably been about a dozen no-confidence votes since that day. Anyway, so he arrives in Brussels, and if you arrive in Brussels as a citizen on that day, that's what you would expect to see. You'd see police lines, barbed wire fences, water cannon trucks, uh, and the like. So, in their wisdom, the press service of the Council of the European Union, that's their building, the kind of place where the summit was taking place, they said, well, we realize that citizens can't come anywhere near the summit, yeah, but um, we're going to do something about this in social media. So they put up a big screen in the summit venue where anything written on Twitter with the hashtag EUCO would appear on the screen. Yeah? You can just imagine, you're starting to think, ah, oh, hang on a minute, yeah. Obviously, all of those people who were armed with smartphones there and others elsewhere started using that to their advantage to have a go at Silvio Berlusconi. Yeah? That's actually a picture of the screen. And this is the kind of style of the tweets which were written and were appearing inside the summit venue. Okay. Yeah. Obviously, what happened there yeah, is there was no credible commitment that whatever would be written on that screen would in any way actually be listened to. It was just a gimmick essentially. You know? If the question had been, pose a question on Twitter and we will ask the best question to Silvio Berlusconi or Herman Van Rompuy or whoever you want, yeah? people may have played the game sensibly because there was a commitment to listen yeah? as well as the commitment to ask. Okay? As a result yeah, of it just being essentially, oh, we'll just put a screen up there, yeah? then it allowed a bunch of people on blogs and on Twitter yeah, to game the system. Yeah? 
to essentially create an, a big fuss and actually get the experiment ended. We managed to get the screen turned off you know, before the end of the summit, which became a story in itself and got covered by the British newspapers and the Italian newspapers and so on. So if you're going to ask people something in social media, what are you going to do with what they tell you? Okay? So you've got to really bear that in mind, and that's generally known as credible commitment. The main story about it, just, uh, it comes from a United States example. Um, the day after Barack Obama was inaugurated as United States president, he set up a website called change.gov. The change.gov website said, here, citizens of the United States, tell me what I should do as president. Yeah. People could put up their suggestions and vote on other people's suggestions. 16 of the top 50 suggestions were legalization of cannabis for medical uses. Yeah. Again, something that Obama was never going to be able to implement. If Obama had said, tell us the 50 ways of improving our, uh, I don't know, service for patients in healthcare, or the, um, prioritize the 20 railroads which need new investments, something like that, he would have got sensible answers. But by framing the question in the wrong way and not having a strategy for dealing with what you could have imagined that people were going to say, he therefore made a problem for himself. So bear that in mind, whatever activity you're doing in social media, if you're opening yourself up in that way, what are you going to do with what the people say back to you? Okay, Very, very important. Right. That, um, apart from just the photo credits, I'm a big fan of Creative Commons, so I'm using loads of Creative Commons photos from, um, from uh, Flickr, so that's why I have to have my kind of slide of credits. It feels like a television program or something, having credits at the end. And then the, my uh, contact information, if you wish to reach me uh, via whatever different uh, networks. I think we have about five minutes for questions. Yeah, so uh, that's it from my presentation. If you have any questions about that or anything to do with kind of European-wide uh, social media, uh, the floor is yours to uh, pose those questions. Yeah, thank you very much, John. <laughs> well, I, I can start if, if, you, if you like. Um, you have mentioned a lot of advantages with with the s different social media. What, what would you say is the biggest risk <coughs> um, as a company? Okay, first of all, th th this is not a choice about whether you do social media or not. The question is whether you engage with what's happening in social media or you don't. Yeah, people will be talking about you anyway. Yeah. And if you have not, as a company, built some kind of presence in social media, someone else is going to have your names or do something with, do something with your name. So essentially, it's not a question of, of if. Yeah? There will be people dis discussing what you do on social media anyway. Yeah? So that's the, kind of, that's the starting point. The second thing, and this is the complicated one, is, and we're still getting there, is, is as a company, is what is the return on investment here and now, of using social media in a company environment. Mm -hmm. And that can be rather hard to determine. Because what is the value of a Twitter follow, a Facebook like, something like that? Yeah? How do you measure that, and how do you kind of convince your senior people that it's, that it's worthwhile engaging in social media? So um, Miko, for, uh, later on, may, um, uh, may mention that, uh, that issue uh, further. And last of all, um, you have to trust your own staff within your company in order to manage to be very active in social media. You can bet that most of the employees of a company, one way or another, or at least, uh, at least a large number of employees of a company, will be using social media in their free time. They'll be doing it for their mountain biking clubs or their dancing classes or whatever it is. The question is how you find a way and a means of doing that within an organization. And that implies a kind of breakdown of the traditional comms functions versus the functions of the rest of the company. So it requires, it requires the top people and the communications people to be able to trust more people within a company with that ability to communicate towards the outside world. So a bit the way that Svanen is doing it, essentially saying, we'll have a po you have a policy that anyone within the company is allowed to be posting on Twitter, well, that actually requires a trusting working environment which some companies have not actually managed to achieve. So I, those are the sorts of things I would say, you've got to do it anyway. Um, Second, the return on investment can be a bit questionable. And third is you need to trust your people and to decentralize if possible. God, interesting. Well, the floor is open. Please, more questions to John? Absolutely. We have uh, seven minutes or something like that. Go ahead. Just, just a second. Um, my name is Roland Williams um, with Artspace. I wonder when it comes to shopping, um, if you can talk about 
social media and the shopping behaviors as in a shopping center or something. Mm. And we also have QR codes now, yep. which are driving a lot of uh, purchases. Can you talk about that? Um, there's an enormous amount of things which we can obviously uh, take out from that. Um, the Essentially, for driving sales, Facebook is probably a better, there's probably a better tool simply because you're going to reach a larger number of people. Um, if you look at the statistics of um, what motivates people to like a Facebook page of a company, the opportunity for managing to get special offers and, la and latest information about that company scores highest as the, mo as the, as the kind of prime motivating, prime motivating factors. Um, so there are ways and means of driving that kind of consumer engagement, essentially, via Facebook on, on social media. QR codes... Um, I think have a better chance of managing to gain success in um, uh, in Stockholm than they do in London, where my experience has been really poor, actually, simply due to, there, in my experience, there being a better coverage of 3G internet around Stockholm than there is in parts of London, particularly in the underground. Um, for those that are not, I guess most of you would have come across it, QR codes is kind of a code that you can scan on your mobile, and then it'll take you to an individual to an individual website. I would say, I just think that the tendency with QR codes is people think, oh, that's a cool technology, we're going to use that. Whereas actually just remembering a simple web URL, that company's, th that company's name dot se slash the special offer, you know, uh, that might be almost as appealing, but at least there's a kind of the immediacy of QR codes. It just strikes me that QR codes are a bridging technology until we end up with near-field technology in mobile phones in coming years as a way of essentially giving that kind of immediacy. You know? um, what I've yet to see, and you may, there may be Swedish examples of it, but there's some in London, is interesting um, uh, um, shopping uses of Foursquare and other, so and, and other geolocation services, so allowing um, people, if they've checked into a given shop, whatever, to manage to make sure that what the, the latest offers and whatever are presented to them in that particular way. Restaurants have been doing it in the UK to a greater extent, but I haven't seen interesting shopping uh, implications of it. Um, I'm not sure that's altogether answered your question. There's at least a few bits and pieces there. If there's some other points that you want to pursue further, happy to, uh, happy to follow. Please. Yeah? He seems satisfied anyway. Okay, good. <laughs> good. <laughs> More questions, please. Just a scratch. Oh. <laughs> there. Over there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the microphone is on its way. Hello. Uh, what would you say is the key to success in B2B uh, communication? It's, it, um, it's more obvious to see advantages in you know, consumer marketing and, and uh, um, politics and, uh, you know, but, but in B2B, what's, what's the uh, approach to, to, to go to? Okay, um, the starting point um, would be go where your people are. That might uh, seem like stating the obvious, but too often people try to kind of attract their potential, their potential customers in B2B environments to where they are rather than going to where, the, where their clients already are based. So the same kind of thing of using the right tools in B2B environments is where are your people in the environment in which you wish to operate on the web? Are they using LinkedIn? Are they using Twitter? Are they using Facebook? Prob well, they might be, but how do you reach them that way? Um, are there ways and means that in the engagement you already have, would it be worth looking at kind of bespoke social networking tools, Yammer or BuddyPress or something of this, something of this nature? So that's the first. Yeah, so go where they are. Second is obviously those potential people you're going to reach are going to be less numerous than if you're in a B to, uh, if you're in a B2C environment, and potentially, yeah, they're going to be have greater engagement with you and an ability to tell you more useful information back. So those are the kind of principles I would use as a start. Yeah, um, the difficulty is is that the out of all of that stuff, there's no perfect simple answer. Yeah. Chances are you'll find some of those people on Twitter, but do you want to be that open with what you're saying to them? You'll find some of those people on LinkedIn, but it might not have necessarily the right tools in order to manage and build the engagement there. Um, so unfortunately, you're probably going to have to use a combination of different tools in order to manage to reach those, those particular individuals, supplementing that as well with your traditional email and web communications, I, I imagine. So there's no, um, there's no one kind of tool for a B2B environment that I would say, this is the particular place you ought to go. You need to, impl you need to manage to make sure, however, that you're sort of ready to escalate to a level that is off the purely public if that becomes a B2B conversation, which is actually something which is almost approaching almost approaching one-to-one. -one. Those are the kind of principles I would start with. Obviously, I don't know exactly what, what 
firm or whatever that you're working in and, and the demography of those people involved. Depending upon that, you might be able to work out some, um, uh, some answers. But definitely go wherever your people are already, but the problem is you're probably not going to find them all in one place, I fear. Okay. Whoops. Well, I think that's about it. Right. Uh, we will come back to you when we have our discussion and, and, and twittering. Yeah, and yeah, I'm sure there'll be just questions before on Twitter as well. Good. <laughs> All right. Absolutely. Right. Okay, so thanks a lot again, John. No